So now let's uh, get down to business. Let me introduce you guys to Dr. Christopher Shapley. Uh, Dr. Shapley earned his veteran degree from Western University of Health Sciences. He then worked in general practice here in New Jersey while studying integrative medicine. He has a certificate in veterinary acupuncture from Chi University and his, uh, what, about two thirds of the way through um, the herbal certification from Chi University. And so he's continuing to, to build his repertoire and his skills. Uh, he joined North Star Vets last month to establish our integrative medicine service. So we're very excited to have him on board and have him contribute to what we're doing here. He has special interest in integrating Eastern and Western modalities, uh, pain management and sports medicine. Uh, and of course, uh, he became interested in Eastern medicine through his lifelong martial arts training. And so that was his, his sort of gateway into uh, this form of medicine. So without any further ado, let me introduce you, Dr. Christopher Shapley. This on your Figure this out, yeah. Right. I'm technologically challenged, so we gotta give me a minute here. Okay. Down there somewhere. Perfect. Yeah, we'll do it here. Okay. Yep. So while Phil's doing this, um, I want to first thank you all for uh, coming out and listening to me talk, and everybody at home, thank you also. Um, a, a little bit of housekeeping, um, anyone who has the notes, uh, I think that Phil had sent out, there's some slight changes to the slides, but the information is, is all there. It's all the same. Uh, just changed and tweaked a couple of things real quick. Um, the other bit of housekeeping is, um, I was unable because I'm technologically challenged to properly embed my personal notes for me to help me along with the lecture. So you guys are gonna kind of have to bear with me as I'm reading my chicken scratch and I apologize in advance for that. And um, lastly, and I say this before every alternative or integrative medicine talk that I give, I just ask, I just ask you to have like an open mind about this. Uh, a lot of these things are gonna kind of sound a, a little alien or strange to you, uh, how you know pattern diagnoses are done, um, all the parts and things that go into doing a pattern diagnosis. But you know the, these these things are are based in science and they and the results are repeatable. And I feel like that's the most important thing uh, for you guys to know. Okay, so we're gonna dive right in. So quick question for you. Sorry, before we dive right in, if I minimize this here, is that going to kick everybody out? Uh, try it. Okay. There you go. Sounds good. All right. That works. All right. So again, um, thank you all for coming out. Um, this is our introduction to integrative medicine. Um, of course, we're going to talk first about where we're at. We're here at uh, North Star Vets in Robbinsville. Um, there are locations, obviously, in Brick and Maple Shade. I work out of uh, Robbinsville and Brick, so I do offer my services just in the uh, Robbinsville and Brick facilities. Um, a little bit of history and background for those that don't know, but um, in the uh, year 2000, it was found, uh, founded as VSDS, a mobile surgery practice. Um, 2003, the first facility with internal medicine and 24-7 uh, emergency uh, was established. In 2010, Dr. Sobe changed the name to North Star Vets. Um, 2011, we moved into a 33,000 square foot facility in central New Jersey with the first satellite uh, opening in uh, southern New Jersey, the Maple Shade location in 2015. And in 2020, uh, the brick uh, satellite opened up. So why use integrative medicine? So we know that veterinary medicine science is constantly marching forward. Uh, there's new surgical procedures, there's new diagnostics, there's new treatments constantly being studied. There are hundreds and hundreds of just general medicine studies out there to kind of make, um, make science and make veterinary medicine you know, advance with the times. 
But I want us to know that, you know, should any of our modern or foundational diagnostics or treatments fail, traditional Chinese veterinary medicine or TCVM, as I'm going to call it moving forward, acupuncture and herbal formulas can uh, offer a well-established and an extensively researched alternative. So there... I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. We cannot hear you online at all. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, perfect. Yes, we we're muted. Sorry about that. Um, so as I was saying, a lot of these herbal formulations have kind of been uh, worked on, modernized, and uh, sort of brought into the 20th, uh, you know, to modern times for, for purposes of, you know, uh, being mindful of endangered species and, and trying to be, uh, use as much plant or insect base as, as we possibly can. So, um, TCVM can uh, benefit veterinary patients with a wide range of health conditions, uh, such as much musculoskeletal, cardiovascular, dermatological, gastrointestinal, neurologic, urinary, behavioral, and much, much more. Um, options are limitless. Uh, back at the other practice I was uh, working at prior to joining Northstar, the joke was that Dr. Shapley always had a needle or an herb for anything in the hospital, anything that was going on. And it's true. Um, I, I have to say before though, picking an herb or figuring out how you're gonna be needling, there's really like one super important step in process you have to go through, which is the pattern diagnosis. Now, before we go to the pattern diagnosis, <clears throat> I, okay, that's not working. Uh, Phil, now I can't advance. We're just having all sorts of technical difficulties. Oh, uh, okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. Good. Oh, beautiful. Thank you. Round of applause. Thank you for a little technical support from the back there. So, um, oh, okay. All right. One more time, just a little louder. Um, so, First, we're going to talk about Duke. Um, <clears throat> Duke is absolutely one of my favorite patients. Um, I love him to death, um, to the point where I get a little choked up talking about him. <clears throat> so he's a 14-year-old male neutered golden retriever, originally presenting for difficulty rising, stiff gait, and CP deficits in the pelvic limbs. Um, he had previously had a TPL, uh, TPLO surgery for uh, cranial cruciate ligament injury years ago, recovered just fine from that. But as, as he was getting older, was having uh, a lot more problems just with mobility, knuckling over. And mom came to me because we were kind of, we were desperate. Um, you know, Deramax really wasn't doing the trick for his pain. Gabapentin really wasn't helping. And again, he was knuckling over. He was kind of losing his back feet. Um, one interesting thing, we're, we're going to talk about constitutions and personalities and all that kind of stuff. Duke, as happy as he looks here, <clears throat> is a classic wood constitution. Uh, wood constitutions are they're not the friendliest. Uh, they're super friendly and super loving when you're doing things on their terms. It's like, I'm a wood constitution. I'm very happy-go-lucky as long as the ship is going in the direction I'm steering it. Uh, Duke 
is exactly that way too. So he actually, um, and I, I think in patterns change and constitutions change based on the disease process that's going on, Duke went from being kind of this wood constitution, not wanting to be needled. He would lip it, lift his lip up at me. He would kind of go to chomp at me when I was putting needles in his front end to uh, basically turning into kind of like an earth constitution, very loving, very just like, hey, you know, uh, happy to see me kind of thing. <clears throat> and actually I saw him tonight before I came in and before I'm allowed to needle him, I have to play with him and I have to give him icy pops too. So I, I as you can tell, I'm very connected to Duke. Um, <clears throat> so we started our treatment off, off uh, about like three or four years ago. I think mom and I were talking tonight and it's been about four years. Um, so I, so we're going to talk about, you know, traditional Chinese veterinary medicine diagnoses. Uh, so you'll kind of understand where I'm getting bony B syndrome from kidney chi deficiency and kidney chi stagnation. Um, we had originally, and, and Duke was a little bit of a, a teacher for me. Um, I had said, okay, well, he's stumbling over his back feet. I did a kind of did a pattern diagnosis. I said, well, I, I know what's going on. I'm just going to throw him on hind quarter weakness. We'll needle him, blah, blah, blah. And he, for a while, he, he, did, he did pretty well. Um, but patterns change over time. Um, and that's what happened with Duke. So I had started him off on a uh, hind quarter weakness. It was three capsules by mouth uh, every 12 hours. This is a Jing Tong formula. Um, found that that really wasn't doing the trick. I wasn't, you know, he wasn't picking up his feet the way I wanted him to. He wasn't, um, you know, responding to the acupuncture, the dry needling the way I had wanted him to. Um, we were starting to lose the back feet. And one of the things in uh, TCVM is you always have to learn to pivot and, and you can't be narrow minded. You always have to be ready to, to pivot and, and change your modality and change what you're doing. And I did that. So I put him on a formula called D1 Yin Z, which is a very, very old formula that's basically for pelvic limb weakness. Uh, and then I started doing electro acupuncture um, on him. Uh, to, to kind of help, you know, get his feet moving. Unfortunately, you can't see the bottom of the slide, but I did, uh, I added, um, you know, kidney one and, and Lu Fong. So kidney one on the back feet, well, would here, and uh, Lu Fong in between the toes to kind of wake up and activate those feet. And um, well, it's four years later and we're, we're still, you know, we're still doing acupuncture. So we had significant improvement uh, during the first three years. Uh, with the last three months, we started exhibiting more of the ataxia and the CP deficits and the pelvic limbs. So as I said before, we were kind of, we, I introduced electroacupuncture um, and that's being performed once a week. And oddly enough, mom's car broke down. She had trouble getting parts and Duke was able to go, I think it was about like almost six weeks uh, without treatment, but Mom is so worried about letting it get away from us that she insists we're doing this once a week. She doesn't care, uh, even if he can go six weeks. And some clients are like that. Others are, you know, you treat them, they're fine. You don't see them for like, you know, six months until the, you know, wheels come off the wagon again. Um, so currently he's uh, only taking the D1 Yin Z. Obviously he's getting, uh, getting his electroacupuncture and we're only doing the Deramax on the really bad days. For Duke, bad days are in the winter. Uh, the invasion of cold into his body really affects his kidney yang and, and is really, you know, causing him a lot of pain and discomfort. And in a perfect world, you know, we would come twice a week, but, you know, once a week and doing Deramax, uh, Deramax on, on his bad days is, uh, is, is good. And, and mom's very, very happy. And so is Duke. So um, let's go into the pattern diagnosis. So like Western medicine, every visit to a TCVM veterinarian starts with patient history, a snap to tail physical exam. Um, we also are looking for a few slightly different things um, that are pretty subtle cues to the average practitioner, but really you know, important points for us. 
Um, as far as what goes into doing a pattern diagnosis, we're always considering yin and yang theory, which I'm going to go into all of these, uh, five elements theory, uh, the Zhang Fu uh, organs theory, uh, the five uh, vital and fundamental substances, uh, six common pathogens, tongue appearance and pallor, femoral pulses, and something else that I'm going to add tonight for us is emotional factors. Um, we're going to add in dietary and lifestyle imbalances also. So if you're a note taker, I'll let you know when I'm going to dive into that. Okay. <clears throat> So first, let's start with the yin-yang th theory. We can't hear you again. Great. <laughs> awesome. All right. I don't know where I was. Uh, so, the con so it's the concept of dualism that all things exist as inseparable and contra uh, contradictory opposites. So yang, your yang energy, your yang side of things, uh, you know, we think about l light, we think about the sun, we think about, you know, strong and assertive, um, assertive uh, dryness, heat, fire, it's male energy, it's positive energy. We think of the heaven, we th the heavens, we think of um, the spring and summer seasons. Um, so warmth and, and revitalization and, and, and renewing is, is yang energy. Uh, with yin energy, we're thinking about, you know, darkness, so nighttime, the moon. Um, Yin personalities are, are nurturing. Uh, yin energies tend to, you know, when imbalance, um, imbalanced, um, you know, introduce damp and cool and, and, you know, it's also water is associated with yin. It's a female energy. It's a negative charge. Um, it's associated with the earth as in, you know, the ground uh, beneath our feet. And autumn and winter um, or those seasons are also associated with, uh, with yin energy. Okay. Let's see here. All right, very good. So disease development from yin and yang uh, perspective. So your normal healthy energy is your zhang qi. So it's the body's resistance and self healing abilities. When you introduce pathogens or evils, as this slide calls it, um, we're, we're talking about, you know, factors that are disturbing the balance of the body. So we have a conflict. And when those pathogens um, kind of override or, you know, uh, are stronger than the healthy energy, that's when we start getting our uh, disharmony. So we'll have often uh, yin and yang excesses. So um, a, an excessive yin is an internal, um, I'm sorry, is an invasion of external dampness or coldness. Um, excessive yang evils or pathogens is the invasion of external wind or heat. Um, when we have a yang deficiency. Um, we're having, you know, basically poor performance, low energy. Um, think of just, you know, that, that flat out animal that, that just can barely lift its head up is having a very severe yang chi deficiency. Um, and then we also have uh, yin deficiencies where we just basically have um, insufficient uh, nutrients or, or chi or blood flow. Um, some Practical examples of uh, young deficiency would be like chronic kidney disease, anemia, hypothyroidism, gastroenteritis, colitis. Um, some examples of um, yin deficiency would be polyuria, polydipsia, um, arthritis, um, polyphagia, any sort of infection also uh, in the body would be considered a um, yin deficiency. So moving from yin, yin and yang theory into the five elements theory, 
Um, the five elements series, basically, the, we have the interactions and the relationships between the five elements. So the five elements being wood, which covers the liver and gallbladder, fire, which covers the heart, pericardium, and small intestine. We have earth, which covers the stomach and the spleen, metal that covers the lungs and large intestine, and water, which is associated with the kidneys and the bladder. You'll see that we have some arrows on the outside going around. So that's a normal harmony pattern. So, and and we, we call these like parent-child relationships. So for instance, wood is the parent of fire, fire being the parent of earth. And then that, so that's the outer Shang cycle. The inner is the key cycle. Um, the key cycle is what we refer to as the grandparent-child relationship. And so where the Sheng cycle um, basically one strengthens the other um, with the key cycle, we're basically trying to um, tonify or make sure that, you know, wood is making sure that earth isn't getting too excessive uh, in, in its chi and in its pattern. So it's, it's the, like I said, it's the grandparent and child. So, I think some, you know, I'll give you, I'll give you guys some examples. So if we have deficient, so obviously if, the, if these cycles are running perfectly fine, we don't have disease, everybody's happy, everything's good. Um, if we have, let's say, um, a mother, uh, mother element that's weak um, and it can't, can, it can't, nourish and nurture and feed the child element, um, we're going to have some deficiencies and we're going to have some illnesses. So one example of that is like liver blood chi deficiency, um, wood being the parent, fire being the child, um, liver falls under wood, um, <clears throat> heart falls under fire. So we're going to have liver blood chi deficiency which is then going to lead to a, a heart blood chi deficiency. So just one being out of balance or one being weak is gonna then affect the next element and organ systems associated. Um, another example of that is the spleen uh, affecting the lung. So the earth element being weak. Um, so the spleen then can't transform and transport fluid um, out of and, you know, out of the lungs or to the lungs, it's not moving the fluids around properly. It'll then cause a um, lung chi deficiency and you're going to get phlegm development and you're going to get stagnation in the lungs, which is going to then lead to pathology in the lungs. Um, again, this is kind of the stuff that I said, it's going to sound a little alien. It's going to sound a little weird. I don't expect you guys to memorize all of this and be able to, you know, spit it back to me or a client, but I want you to see more so the complexity of it all. And that it's not just as simple as, as throwing herbs and needles in that we actually do sit down and we have to figure things out. We have to figure out where the disease and the pattern is coming from. Um, we're going to go on now with um, like the child element affecting the mother. So the child is really, really unruly and the mother can't handle it. Um, so an example of that would be like a spleen tea deficiency leading to the heart, heart blood um, deficiency. So basically the child is so rebellious, the earth is then, you know, causing and overriding the parent. Um, there's another cycle too. Um, so those two were examples of like the Sheng cycle, um, examples of the key cycle being out of whack. Um, we have the overwhelming cycle. So where your grand, the grandparent element is restraining the child way too much. So you have liver chi stagnation, um, that's so excessive that, uh, the metal can't inhibit what the liver is doing, and then that causes pathology in the stomach. So, you know, we see in the key cycle in the inner that the metal is supposed to be calming the wood, 
and then the wood is supposed to be calming the the earth. Um, so if the metal's not doing that or not able to do that, and the wood is just too excessive, we're going to start seeing GI signs and stomach issues, um, such as like anorexia, diarrhea, vomiting, because the liver is literally just so unruly that it's pounding on the stomach. The liver chi is just pounding on the stomach. Um, and then the last one is the insulting cycle. So where you have, uh, let's say again, liver chi stagnation, um, and then the metal, um, you have the liver chi stagnation that's countering the metal. So if you follow the arrows again, so it's actually going backwards to the metal. Um, and it's causing a counter restraint. And then what's that doing? It's causing flank pain, causing cough. So one practical example of that is, again, if you have a severe hepatopathy, you're going to have pain in the flanks. Uh, that is basically the, the wood element overriding the, the metal. Okay. So after that, um, Zhang, the Zhang Fu organs are also uh, linked to the five elements theory. So everything here goes hand in hand. So basically Zhang Fu translates to solid hollow. Uh, the Zhang Fu organs have different functions in TCVM than other uh, in, uh, than in Western medicine. Uh, Zhang Fu theory focuses on how the organs interact with blood and qi, as well as how they interact with one another. So each Zhang Fu organ can have an excess of deficiency, stagnation of blood or qi associated with a particular disease. Uh, the Zhang organs are the yin organs, so the, the solid organs, and they govern the body's physical and mental state as well as storing qi. And then the fu organs are the yang, the hollow organs, and they govern the exterior of the body as well as food and waste elimination. So with each and every organ, there is a element with each element and uh, there is personality traits, uh, for example, you know, with liver, um, anger is the emotion that you see when liver when the liver is just out of whack. It, when liver chi stagnation is running rampant, or you have liver heat, you're going to see aggression. Um, with uh, heart um, heart chi excess, think about that that cavalier that just is bouncing all over the place. Also has a heart condition. Um, but it's just, you know, manic, just super manic. Uh, that, that is, you know, showing us that we're having issues with the heart channel itself. Um, liver and gallbladder in the wood. Um, we have the heart and the small intestines are associated with fire. Um, spleen and uh, stomach are together. Um, those are associated with the earth constitutions. In Chinese medicine, you know, they, they say that the spleen also is part of digestion. Uh, we, of course, know that it's not. Just like in, uh, in Chinese medicine, the heart is where the mind is held or the shen. Obviously, we know that that's not true, but the principles still, you know, uh, still remain the same as far as uh, treatment and diagnosis. So again, you know, uh, the spleen in the stomach covers di uh, digestion, absorption of, nutri uh, absorption of nutrients, and they produce, that's what produces the chi in the blood. Um, lungs and large intestines are connected. That's under metal. Uh, that controls your chi. Um, that controls respiration and distribution of blood and body fluid. Um, so going back to, you know, that, that key cycle disharmony where we were having issues with, you know, phlegm developing in the lungs because we weren't able to properly move um, body fluids um, and it was causing stagnation and phlegm. And then lastly, we have the kidney and the bladder, which is under the water constitution. Um, our Water constitutions, when they're out of out of sync, uh, tend to be uh, very fearful. Just you know, very very timid, hiding you know, hiding in the in the corner. Um, and you know, uh, kidney and bladder stores essence. It, it uh, controls reproduction. It's where your 
your Jing Qi or your, uh, the Qi that you're born with is all stored. So um, when, we're, when we're having dysfunctions with the, with the kidneys, uh, especially, we're, we're seeing that, that vital uh, energy being drained uh, very quickly. Um, also, it, the uh, kidney and bladder um, you know, produce marrow and blood. And you can think of that even in, in kind of a, a practical sense. Erythropoietin signals a bone marrow to produce red blood cells. So you can see that there is some sort of science and, and linkage you know, uh, between those. All right. Then we have the five vital substances. So we have chi. We're worried about chi excesses, we're worried about chi deficiencies. Um, it's the life force and flows through the Jing Lao or the meridians, which correspond to our acupoints. Um, Jing is known as essence. It's the substance that is responsible for both the essential immaterial or the soul um, and the essential physical being or the body of the patient. It's yin in nature and it's stored in the kidneys. We have the Shen, which is the yang portion of, of the Qi. It's often translated as the spirit. It's responsible for regulating emotions and it's stored in the heart. We have the Zhu, which is the blood, the liquid force of the body and its key uh, proponent is nourishment. Um, it's a subset of Qi and Yin in nature. Uh, qi gives rise, rise to blood which nourishes, nourishes the Zhang Fu organs, which then produce more qi. Um, and then we have the Jing Yi, translates to the body fluids. This refers to the thin, clear, and water-like fluids that nourish the skin and the muscles, like teardrops and, and sweat. Then we have the six common pathogens. So we have wind, we have cold, we have summer heat, we have dampness, we have dryness, and we have fire. Excess or deficiency of, of well, actually, I'm sorry, excess or invasion of any of these is where we're gonna start getting into the meat and potatoes of the pathology uh, and the actual disease. All of everything I just said before, if that's out of, out of sync, if there's some sort of deficiency or excess, that's what allows these pathogens to move in. So we need to understand how all the elements and all the organ systems are interconnected. So then when we have these illnesses, we can kind of walk back, where did it all start? Was there a spleen chi deficiency? Was there some sort of jing chi or kidney chi deficiency? Was there a heart chi excess? Um, was there a lung chi? Uh, was there lung chi stagnation? Um, so the, the painful road to this slide is all to let us, let us know where, where did the problem come into the body? And then what are we going to strengthen? Am I going to be strengthening the spleen and the stomach? Am I going to be strengthening the heart? Am I going to be tonifying the liver? What am I going to be doing? Um, and I can't know unless I go through those first, first bunch of steps. Um, so the six pathogens um, are wind. Um, so that moves upward and outward. So seizures, uh, tremors, that is what we would call internal wind. Um, and then you have pruritus or you know, itchiness, which is external wind. Um, we'll typically see that in the spring. So when do you all see all your dermatological cases? Well, spring and fall when it's windy too. So, um, so there is, you know, there, there's a, there again, you know, that wind invasion, um, a lot, a lot of times, um, you know, the wind itself will cause disharmony or it'll, it'll frighten dogs that are prone to seizures into having small seizures, you know, just, just the noise, if they have any sort of no, noise phobia, um, the Chinese will say that, you know, it's just the wind alone that's causing, that's causing, you know, the, the seizure threshold to, to drop in and is allowing them to have a seizure. Um, then we have cold, which damages kidney yang and blocks qi flow. So that's what's causing pain. 
is coldness. So when are your old arthritic dogs their worst? Winter, cold days. So hopefully this is all starting to make a little bit of sense. Then we have feet, a heat fire, excuse me. Um, so that disturbs the shen or that disturbs the mind, damages uh, body fluids and, and blood vessels. Um, when we're dealing with heat fire, obviously that's, that's more in the summer. I always equate this to <clears throat> when you have a dog that's coming in for a heat stroke and they have hematochesia and they're vomiting and, and just all of these things. We're, we're damaging what is holding in these body fluids and, we're, and, and blood and it's expressing itself in that way. Um, then we have dryness, which damages lung yin and, um, and body fluids and, and leads to blood deficiency. So we're drying out all the tissues, we're drying out. So uh, I like to think of this also, if you think about the, your kidney cats, your, um, they have, you know, they'll have a, a kidney chi deficiency um, or even a, you know, a, young deficiency that'll that'll lead them to just not being able to hold in fluids just being constantly dehydrated so think of dryness in that in that fashion and then we have the summer heat which is like the damp heat so that's kind of like you know those those really humid yucky days uh, they have more of them in florida uh, than we do up here but that's where you see you know your skin infection so your purulent otitis externa uh your moist dermatopathies that are happening. And again, that's invasion of damp and heat that's, that's going into potentially the lung channels or you know, even uh, the spleen channels. Well, you'll, you'll see that also. Um, so six pathogens, we kind of need to know what those are too, see where we're going. Um, I always look at the tongue and that's a really great um, way for me to kind of tell a little bit what's what's going on, or at least confirm what's going on, or if I'm on the fence about something, it'll it'll push me in one direction or other. So, a uh, patient's tongue can yield uh, a lot of information. So, in TCVM, it's uh, and even in obviously in traditional Chinese medicine, it's divided into regions. So, the front or the tip of the tongue is the heart. Then we have the lungs. The side is the liver and the gallbladder. Then the center is the spleen and the stomach. Then the back is the kidney, the bladder, the intestines. So we're looking at pallor, redness, uh, you know, deep purple represents a deficiency. Um, so let me, let me read that better. So pallor, redness, and deep purple represent deficiency, excess, and stagnation, respectfully, uh, res respectively. Uh, dryness, cracking, or the presence of film on the tongue also helps us kind of determine um, the TCVM pathogens that may have invaded the body. So if we have like a yellow coating on the tongue, we know that there's some sort of severe infection that's going on in the body. Um, we know if the tongue is kind of like, overflowing over the teeth and it's pale that we have a chi deficiency. Um, and I use that, you know, if, if the tip of the tongue is, you know, purple um, or bright red, you know, I know that there's something going on in the heart channel that I, I really need to desperately address. And obviously, you know, it's a little hard to see all the way in the back of the tongue, but, you know, if we haven't seen any paleness or, um, the purple pallor to that, then I, I definitely know there's something going on with it, with the kidney and the bladder or potentially even the intestines. And then femoral pulse, pulses. I'm always feeling femoral pulses. So much like the tongue, the femoral pulses are divided into regions linked to the heart, the lungs, the liver, gallbladder, bladder, kidneys, intestines, and then palpating the quality of these pulses if they're bounding, thready, slippery, weak, floating, and their corresponding organ systems helps, helps practitioners to accurately uh, form a comprehensive pattern diagnosis. So if we have deep and weak pulses in the kidney uh, yang area, um, I know that we have um, a chi deficiency of kidney yang. If I feel a very thin or thready pulse, um, 
in the heart meridian, uh, the heart uh, region of the pulse, I know that I have a blood chi deficiency and the body's trying to compensate for that by tightening itself up and being more forceful. Um, so that, that's some examples of that. Um, <clears throat> then we do obviously visual, there's always a visual assessment and palpation. So we're uh, examining the skin and the coat. Um, basically we're looking over the, at the overall quality and checking for dryness or green, greasiness. So dryness is going to tell me that we have a blood or a chi deficiency. Greasiness is going to tell me that we have damp heat. Um, assessment of the skin and coat can help determine whether there are any deficiencies, ex excesses or pathogens. Uh, by palpating the back shoe points, which actually is the bladder meridian, um, and they're all linked to different organ systems. So bladder 23 is associated with the kidney. Bladder 18 is associated with liver. 17 is blood and so on and so forth. So I can kind of figure out what's going on even by uh, palpating the, the back shoe points and, and help me kind of localize where there's uh, an excess or a deficiency. If there's a deficiency, you're going to feel a divot. Um, if there's an excess, it's, it's going to bulge out just a little bit. So you, you kind of know, do I need to sedate or do I need to tonify with my needles or with my herbs? Um, <clears throat> and then once our pattern diagnosis has been formed, I, you know, for example, kidney chi deficiency, yang excess, liver stagnation, then we can start treatment with acupuncture and herbs. If you guys will let, it will kind of give me an opportunity to go into emotional factors too, because that's kind of key. And I promise I'll try to keep it brief. Okay. Um, so emotional factors, um, anger is one of the emotions we look at. So that leads to chi rebellion, liver stagnation, and liver yang rising. So think of fear-based aggression that happens in a shelter dog. What's happening is that dog being in that shelter, and obviously it doesn't have all of them, but that dog being in that shelter is causing liver chi stagnation, which is then causing phlegm to form. And that phlegm goes to the brain. So if I have a shelter dog that, you know, they, somebody just took home and they tell me, you know, doc, we're really not afraid of loud noises, but sudden movements, they, they go and they snap. Well, I know there's a liver chi stagnation. Of course, I've done my pattern diagnosis. I know there's a liver chi stagnation. I know that that liver chi, liver chi stagnation has transported phlegm to the brain, causing stagnation in the shen, of extinguishing or affecting the heart fire. And I know where I need to needle. I know that this dog needs to be on liver happy, which is uh, one of the Jing Tom formulations, to break up that, that stagnation. Um, then we have joy. So excessive joy dissipates heart chi. So again, think about those cavaliers. You know, uh, some will, some TCVM practitioners will argue that because they're so happy, they deplete all of their chi, their heart chi, and then that just gives them bum hearts. You know, they develop, you know, um, heart defects as they, as they get older. Um, those that are born with heart defects that are very, very happy have what we would call like a Jing Qi deficiency as well as a heart Qi deficiency. So they weren't born with enough uh, Jing Qi or vital Qi to the point where it sapped a little bit of that heart Qi also. Um, then we have fright, um, which leads to heart Qi, uh, blood deficiency, insomnia, panic, and other mental disorders. So think again of a noise phobia in a shelter dog. They're just freaked out by a door slamming, kids running around. That's not the liver. If I give that dog, if I, if I try to tonify the liver and try to dissipate liver cheese stagnation and give it liver happy, I'm not going to fix it. I need to address the, the heart chi. I need to address the shen. I need to make sure that they're, you know, we're, we're taking care of that heart chi deficiency. Uh, then there's worry, which leads to, Spleen, chi, stomach, chi, stagnation, anorex, anorexia, abdominal fullness. Well, think about it yourself. Last time you're worried, nervous, scared, whatever. What's what's going on? You know, you're you're in the bathroom. That's that's what's happening. Um, grief. 
that leads to lung chi deficiency, cough, dyspnea, chest pain. Have you ever been so sad and so cried so hard that your chest hurts? The principle with that is, is uh, grief leading to a lung chi deficiency. <clears throat> Then we have melancholy, which leads to a zen, zen chi deficiency. So we're, we're losing that chi that helps us, you know, fight off infection. You know, so people are chronically depressed or there are studies saying that they're more prone to illness from, from you know, the melancholy, melancholy, excuse me. Then we have fear, which damages kidney chi, which can lead to urinary leakage, infertility and, and hind end weakness. Then we also have to factor in because we know every, you know, the three things you don't talk about in, in your exam are religion, politics, and dog food, as everybody has an opinion and usually a very strong one at that. So, but, you know, if we have a dietary imbalance, uh, such as overeating, that leads to food stagnation, phlegm, internal heat. So they're more prone to develop uh, liver issues or skin issues. And then poor diets that aren't nutritionally balanced, the, the folks that think that, just chicken and rice is good enough, uh, leads to food stagnation and chi and blood deficiency. And then the last thing too we need to look at is a lifestyle imbalance. So physical uh, overworking leads to chi deficiency. You're just depleted of all your energy. You don't get enough rest. You're not getting enough nutrition. Uh, think about those hunting dogs or working dogs that are just go, 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 and they're very thin. And you know the owner comes in and, and saying, well, I don't know, they've been a little bit off and they lost some weight. Um, that's you know, physically overworking them to the point where they're developing injuries and they're having chi deficiency. Um, because also, if you're being overworked, it's going to lead to kidney chi deficiency, which is going to affect the bones because we know that the kidneys rule the bones. Um, it's going to also lead to tendon and ligament issues because the, um, the if you're having liver chi depleted, liver is in charge of tendons and ligaments. So again, um, then we have mental overworking. Um, so constantly, you know, worried um, or, you know, just either over or under mentally stimulated. So we're gonna create all day or having, you know, 10 kids running around pulling at their tail, that's gonna lead to blood deficiency or a Shen, uh, a Shen imbalance. Uh, insufficient work. So the dogs that just lay around don't do anything. We're going to have uh, chi and blood stagnation. So stiffness, pain, weight gain. Um, and then excessive sexual activity uh, consumes kidney jing. So they're just going to be poor performers down the road. They're going to eventually develop potentially, you know, kidney and re reproductive issues. Um, and that's kind of off the off the slides uh, portion of things. So how do we correct these? So one of the things that we do obviously is acupuncture. So we're using acupoints to diffuse or infuse chi um, and blood associ uh, associated with uh, organ systems through the meridians, the channels. Uh, meridians and acupoints were mapped out centuries ago uh, in veterinary um in veterinary medicine, um, a lot of them are based on uh, the human model. They were doing acupuncture on oxen and horses long time ago. Um, there, there are books on it going back to some of the older dynasties um, because that was that was their car, that was their plow, that was that's what tilled the field. So. They didn't care so much about the dogs and cats, but they really wanted to make sure that their equipment was working, their horses, their, their, their oxen. Um, with me, um, with most practitioners, acupuncture sessions typically last 20 to 30 minutes and, can, and should, be should take place in a serene setting within the hospital. Pro tip, turn the lights out, open up Pandora, play um, like Tai Chi music, or you know some Buddhist monk chanting, it really does drown out the sound. Uh, most of the time, I walk back in and the dog's asleep and the client's asleep. So that means everybody, we're harmonizing. We're definitely, we're harmonizing there. Um, so the most common acupuncture techniques used in veterinary medicine, um, dry needling, aquapuncture, moxibustion, and electroacupuncture. 
laser acupuncture is also used. Um, I didn't have as much access to it when I wrote this talk, but here now, thankfully, at North Star, I have a lot of access to laser acupuncture, which is great when we're uh, when we're trying to needle exotics. There's a ferret that I'm trying to do uh, acupuncture on, and I tried dry needling them. That didn't work. That didn't work at all. So we moved on to laser acupuncture and that is working. And, you know, it's something that we can do on uh, small mammals, you know, rabbits, uh, you know, like I said, ferrets, uh, chinchillas, whatever, birds, reptiles, you know, we can, we can, we can definitely utilize laser acupuncture. And like I said, it's a new, newer tool for me. So I'm super happy to have it back in my, in my repertoire. So dry needling, we basically know what that is, the technique of placing sterile needles uh, into predetermined acupoints. And most of your dogs are going to be very calm like this. So here we got a picture of a beagle. We know how they are in an exam room, usually bouncing all over the place, but you can get them to accept the needles. Uh, not necessarily, it's not gonna happen in the first session, so don't expect miracles, but you eventually they will start accepting the needles just like Duke started accepting the needles. Um, then we have aquapuncture, which is uh, a favorite of mine with cats, especially, um, or bouncy dogs that there's just no way I'm going to be able to, you know, that super happy pit that um, I don't have the opportunity to laser. Um, they're bouncing all over the walls. I'm, tr I'm trying to put needles in. And as soon as I put them in, one needle's falling out. So I'll a lot of times use aquapuncture. Um, typically, we'll, I'll use B12 in, actually, I will only use B12 in cold uh, invasion. So because B12 in Chinese medicine is warming. So it adds energy, it adds that yang energy. And then I'll use sterile saline when I want to, um, for instance, I had a dog that was having chronic skin issues. Mom didn't want to do anything but herbs and acupuncture. Well, I wasn't going to put a warming energy into the points. Um, so I used sterile saline to kind of help cool and, and subdue uh, and sedate those points. So that's, again, another pro tip. Cold invasion, B12. Um, B12 if you have any sort of excess or, or heat, use, uh, use sterile saline. Then there's moxibustion, um, which is basically the burning of moxin. It's often mugwort um, and safe to use um, to basically dissipate heat in cold patterns. So um, usually your young deficient patients, uh, moxibustion is, is really great to use. You don't have to buy a needle with a cup and put moxa in there and set it on fire and set off the fire alarms. They do make smokeless moxa and you literally just hold it over the acupoint, uh, acupoint for, you know, I do a count of 10, you know, other practitioners might feel differently, but I feel a count of 10 is, is pretty good. Obviously you don't want to get it too close because you don't want to singe the fur or burn the skin or anything. Um, but uh, the smokeless and the flameless is, is uh, a, a favorite of mine also. Um, then there's me doing electroacupuncture. Um, so I tend to use use it for any sort of neuropathies that are going on. So degenerative myelopathies, uh, intervertebral disc disease, anything where we don't know where our feet are or we're really super, super weak. Um, there are other practitioners who use it um, very successfully for dealing with pain also, because it just breaks up all that stagnation in, in that area. Um, as I said, for me, I predominantly use it for any, any neuropathies that, that I have going on. And then of course, my favorite, and I feel um, I'm not successful unless I'm incorporating herbs. And again, that's my clinical experience. Uh, a lot of veterinarians are very successful with just exclusively using acupuncture. I like to hedge my bets. I like to do everything uh, to 100% to ensure success in my mind. Um, so 
I feel that Chinese herbs are, are, are most effective when we're using them in combination with acupuncture and vice versa. Acupuncture is most effective when we're using Chinese herbs. Um, herbal formulations, at least the ones that I get from Jingtang, um, they, you know, a licensed distributor, they've been researched thoroughly uh, and documented documented through clinical studies to be safe and, and effective. So you know where you're getting them from. They're, they're not using any animal byproducts. Uh, you know, we're not using tiger bone. We're not, you know, we're not killing off, you know, rare species of birds for, you know, for the purposes of, uh, for, you know, feathers or bone or, or whatever. Um, and most of our modern day herbal formulations are derived from age old formulas They've been used for generations by physicians practicing traditional Chinese medicine on people. As I said at the beginning, these are just modified a little bit for, for our, our patients, our, our pets. <clears throat> so talk's gone a long time, I know. We're going to, um, but I do want to give a pattern diagnosis and what talk would be complete without a little bit of quiz for y'all too. So we go. So no, I didn't tell you about this at the beginning because I didn't want anybody to have any sort of like, you know, anxiety or spleachy, spleen, devour their spleen chi and have to run out of the out of the room. Um, so we have Sassy, who's a 12-year-old uh, female spade beagle with a history of pelvic limb weakness. She comes into your clinic. Eleanor reports that she's wanting to go on fewer walks and now spends most of her time either laying in the sun or near heating ducts. Her symptoms are worse on cold and rainy days. So <clears throat> upon entering the exam room, Sassy seems timid and slightly fearful. You notice a dry and dull texture to her coat. She is panting and you can see a purple pallor towards the back of her tongue. Her sacral region is cold to the touch and her hips seem painful as you palpate. Her femoral pulses are deep and weak, especially at the level of the kidneys. One thing I forgot to mention before, and I apologize, when you're feeling them, when you're looking, evaluating the code in the outside, feel the ears. Are the ears warm? Feel the back. Is the back cold? Are the feet cold? Are the feet hot? That is also going to tell you Again, excess or, or deficiency or an invasion of cold, invasion of heat. So what do we feel like her constitution is going to be? Remember, so we have uh, wood, fire, earth, metal, water. She's water constitution, absolutely. Is there a deficiency or is there an excess pattern going on here? She's looking to go into the warmth. She likes the sun. She's got a deficiency. Um, <clears throat> what would you What would you say her pattern diagnosis is? So we know she's a we know she's a water element. What What organ is associated with water? Anybody? I point to you because you answered before. So yes, kidney. So we have a kidney. Uh, kidney yang and kidney chi deficiency, or you can very simply say kidney yang chi deficiency, which leads to bony B syndrome, which, which is basically our way of saying arthritis, osteoarthritis. Um, so how are we going to treat her? Well, that's, that's simple. We're going to, we're going to do acupuncture on her. We're going to, you know, but what are we looking to tonify? looking to tonify the kidneys. We're looking to use points that are gonna relieve pain, help us regain mobility. So um, if we have a chi deficiency, my, one of my favorite points is stomach 36, which is the chi well. So that really, you hit stomach 36 right here and it, um, it, it gets that chi moving and flowing. As Phil said in the beginning, I've been training in martial arts since I was six years old. I met a lot of Asian Americans. I've led, met a lot of Asian um, immigrants. When I started getting into Kung Fu 25 years ago, I, and obviously well before I became a veterinarian and got in, involved in integrative medicine, I met a lot of guys that had either scars right at stomach 36 or they had tattoos. Um, and these were these old masters. And I remember 
saying to them, what happened? Does, did ever, does ever, is there something at knee level where you, where you all live that you're just banging into? And it's, or is it fashionable to get a tattoo right there? And they always told me, oh, it's for my energy. It's for my chi, my chi, my chi. And I know I was like, all right, well, okay, fine. Um, now becoming a practitioner makes sense to me. So uh, a lot of these guys had these tattoos or these acid burns or these scars there purposely to make sure that their chi is constantly flowing and that they're constantly energized and that there's no stagnation in their body. Because if you've been doing martial arts for 50, 60 years, you got a lot of stagnation, you're really banged up, your joints, everything. So these guys, they, they, you know, they swear by it. Um, not that I'm recommending that everybody go home and do that, but it is a great place to needle when you have pain and stagnation there. Um, so, I think one of the biggest takeaway points to this whole entire talk is um, do the pattern diagnosis if, if that's what you're interested in or be accepting of another practitioner's pattern diagnosis. Because you know if you're not interested or you're not doing TCVM, uh, a TCVM practitioner can really be a help and even a guide to you in, in, in some cases. Um, they're not trying to tell you what to do or how to do it or take over your case or tell you you're doing it wrong. We all really just want to help and we're kind of taking it from a different perspective. Um, I've worked very closely with veterinarians over the years um, and I've been able to help a lot of patients and we've been able to marry and blend Western and Eastern medicine um, and have had really you know, successful outcomes. And, and my goal is always quality of life. I'm not a quantity of life kind of doctor. And I can say nine times out of 10, eight times out of 10, we're really being able to improve that quality of life and, and and marrying the two, you don't have to worry about interactions uh, per se. Um, I will warn you if you're going to prescribe herbs that lower blood pressure and they're already on a blood pressure uh, medication, don't do it. You know, it's simple as that. You know, um, it's okay to wean them, you know, based on the owner's desires. Um, a lot of times owners do not want their dogs on, on pharmaceuticals. If you're going to 